A while back, I was taking an international flight and uh, was planning to be out of town and out of the country for a little while. And uh, in the process, somebody said to me, you ought to try a pair of noise-canceling headphones. You ever heard of those? So I started doing a little bit of research and uh, hopped online. I had a gift card to use. And so I ordered myself kind of an inexpensive pair of these things. And uh, I get on the plane and I put these things on and they do what they say. It's like, it's awesome. It's like, there's noise, now there's not. There's noise, now there's not. And I'm sitting there over here doing this, like, you know, just, this is awesome because of how it works. Because you get on a plane, it's a long flight, and it's like, some point, I just want to kind of just focus. I don't want to hear all this. I just kind of want to block all that out. Haven't you ever thought it sure would be nice to have noise-canceling headphones for your soul? Anybody? Because there's so much noise in the world around us, so much stuff that gets thrown our way, so many things that we face. And there's times when I just go, boy, for my mind, I wish I could quiet some of those things. Not too long ago, I was having a conversation with a friend, and I could tell that they just just weren't themselves. And they said, you know, sometimes I I just don't understand why I think the things that I think. Around that same time, somebody was like, I, I, just, I just don't know why I'm so angry. Somebody else had said something about, I just, I just feel sad so much of the time. And it just caused me to think so much of who we are and how we respond to the world around us is affected by the thoughts and what goes on in our minds. Isn't that true? It's affected by the voices in our heads. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that like, I, I hear voices. I don't mean it like that way, Right? But all of us have these voices in our heads, every single one of us. We have these thoughts, we have these emotions, we have these things that go on in our mind that are important for us to think about and to consider. When I say this, when we talk about the voices in our heads over these next few weeks, we're talking about the thoughts that try to persuade us to think or act or feel in a certain way. So when we talk about the voices in our heads, we're talking about those thoughts that try to persuade us to think or to act or to feel in a certain way. So where, where do these voices come from? Well, some of them just, just clearly come from the people around us. It's peer pressure, it's expectations, it's our culture. For others of us, there's, there's all kinds of things that influence us, the music we listen to, movies, TV, social media. Some of it come from the experiences in our past. The voices in our head are, are directed by our pain or our victories, lessons we've learned. Sometimes they arise from our expectations of the future, and it's the goals that we've set, the values that we have, the things we try to hold on to for security. Ultimately, there's these thoughts, these feelings, these emotions, the fears, the things that happen in our minds. And this is an important thing for us to talk about. In both the Old and the New Testament, and Jesus quotes this on multiple occasions, there's this thought that the Bible gives to us that says you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength Seems like I'm leaving one out. Is there another one? With all your mind. Your mind is an important thing. And what you do with your mind is actually a part of your worship to God. So in this series, and I think this is important, it is time for a checkup from the neck up. That's what we're going to do through these next few weeks, and we're gonna look at some subjects that that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna get into pretty serious detail about what scripture says about some of these things. And thanks, some of you even weighed in on some of these things this week on social media. We are going to talk about things like, why why don't I feel good enough? What do I do with anger and resentment and confusion and loneliness, fear and depression? But today, we're, we're going to start with, with kind of laying a foundation. We're talking about something really basic. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 today. We're going to go to the very beginning. We're going to start with something basic. We're going to talk about what do you do with these thoughts that come to your mind. Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Let, let's just read the story, and then we'll come back to it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman... Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You, 
You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. If if you start at the beginning of the book of Genesis and you start reading, what you find is this is the first time that humanity has to wrestle with the thoughts that are going on, the the voices that are in their heads. And we look at this and we ask ourselves the question, well, how did Adam and Eve handle that? The question is, not so good, right? (laughs) The reality is humanity has had to bear the consequences of that Ever since. This is the story that we often refer to as the fall of man. It's when sin came into the world. And as we look at this, it helps us to think about our own thinking, not just about Adam and Eve's. It helps us to think about how we think as well. So, what I want to give to you today is we're going to walk back through that story. I want to give you four questions, four questions for thinking about your thinking. We're going to talk about this. Now, in this series, we're going to get into some pretty specific detailed subjects as we get into this and deal with some of the specific emotions, the thoughts that we wrestle with. But there's a whole chorus of voices that end up in our heads. And today we're going to talk about four questions for thinking about your thinking. And let me challenge you with this. Before we get any of the specific stuff, if I had to say to you, what's the voice in your head? Like, what's the one that you hear? For many of us, as soon as we talked about this subject, there were thoughts that began to to roll through your mind. There were were voices, there were emotions, there were feelings that you thought about. As we go through this today, my hope and prayer is that the Holy Spirit will be able to take what we're talking about in a very general way and apply it in a very specific way to you. We're going to look at what happened in the Garden of Eden on that day. Four questions for thinking about your thinking. Here's the first one. Number one, where is this coming from? When, When you have a thought that runs through your mind, The first question that we should ask is, where is this coming from? What's the source? Why am I thinking this? This is a good place to start. Go back to our story. Watch what happens. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty. And can I I just insert there, is still more crafty, right? (laughs) Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? One of the best things we can do when we're thinking about our thinking is to ask ourselves the question, what is the source of this thought? Like, where is this coming from? Why is this in my head? Where where did this come from? For Eve, the, the answer to that question is easy. It came from the serpent. It came from this snake that she encountered that we read about in this story. Now, theologians like to kind of wrestle with, now, what, what, what was this snake? Was it just a snake? Some theologians will say it was just this creature, and, and possibly before the fall of man, animals were able to talk to each other and to humans, and so that's how this happened. For many people, we believe that this serpent is actually an incarnation of Satan, and we'll get to that here in just a couple of minutes. And some people just say, well, it's just actually a creative tool. It's, a, it's an allegory. It's an analogy to be able to tell this story. Here's what we know. No matter how you want to define it, what we find here is that the devil, who, by the way, hates God, because he hates God, he hates all of God's creation and wants to destroy it, saw a way here through this interaction that we read about Eve having with the serpent, found a way to be able to put some voices, destructive voices, in her head. I think it's interesting that he chose a snake how many of you snakes give you the heebie-jeebies? Anybody? <laughs> right, the week before last, the president of the nation of Liberia had to work from home. His office is in what's called the Foreign Affairs Building in Liberia, and it had to be fumigated because in the lobby, there was a hole in the wall, and they watched snakes go in and out of it. <laughs> they have black snakes in Liberia that are poisonous. They're, they weren't exactly sure what kind of snakes they were, but they weren't going to take any chances and told the president you might want to stay home for a few days. Here's the official statement. The press secretary says, quote, the fumigation has begun to take care of crawling and creeping things. That's a very detailed statement, isn't it? Some of us need to take care of some of the crawling and creeping things in our head. 
these thoughts that come? Where do they come from? This, this is a good question to ask. Where do our thoughts come from? When a thought hits you, it's good for you to ask, what's the origin of this? Why, why is this even in my head? Let me give you a few options. This probably isn't exhaustive, but some things to think about. Some thoughts come from God. Like, I honestly believe some of the thoughts that we think come directly from God himself. Like, he, he drops these thoughts in our head. We call that the Holy Spirit at work, right? He's our comforter. He's the one that works in our lives. So some thoughts come from God. And I believe there's some things that God just directly puts in our minds. Now, we, we know this from Scripture, that God knows your thoughts. You know that, right? It's a little terrifying sometimes, right? <laughs> He's a mind reader. Like, he knows your thoughts. David talks in the Psalms about, Lord, search me, know my heart, know my thoughts. And good thoughts come from God. James chapter 1, verse 17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So the, the good thoughts that we have, those thoughts come from God. But some thoughts come from our, what, we, what I would just call our wise mind. Like some thoughts just come from our good thinking. They come from our wise mind. Your mind is, is in many ways, your brain is just another muscle in your body. And as you use it, it develops strength. It develops patterns. It, it picks up common sense. You develop good thinking. And so some things are just your good thinking. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 8. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways. But the folly of fools is deception. So this is important for us to think about our part in nurturing good thoughts. Now let's turn the tables a little bit. Some thoughts come from evil sources. Like in the same way that some thoughts come from God, some thoughts also come from evil, or we might even say satanic, sources. In this scripture, the, the devil is referred to as a serpent. And no matter how you how stack it up, no matter how you want to define it, the reality is it was from a satanic source that these thoughts came to Eve. The Bible refers to the devil as a serpent. Revelation chapter 20, verse 2 says, He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Now, look, the, the truth is that when you receive a thought from an evil source, odds are it's not from the devil himself, right? Because the devil does not have the same abilities or powers as God. So he can't be everywhere at the same time. He can only be in one place. That's the good news. The bad news is he has an army of minions, and they're all over. And for the record, they've figured you out, right? So they know how to respond. Look at this. Second Chron or excuse me, First Chronicles chapter twenty-one, verse one, says that Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. Now, the Bible does not seem to express anywhere that the devil knows how to read your thoughts. He doesn't have the same powers of, as God, but he does know how to influence your thoughts. And his evil army knows how to influence your thoughts. I don't know if it's the power of suggestion. I don't know if it's how we open ourselves up to thoughts. Somehow, I, I, I can't necessarily explain it all. Scripture doesn't go to great detail about this, but we do know that the forces of evil may at times influence our thoughts. Here's how Paul talks about it. He says, the God of this age, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, says the God of this age, that's a little g, because it's not talking about God the Father, but how our heavenly Father has allowed the devil to have some rulership, some authority in this day and time on planet Earth. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So it's important for us to recognize that some thoughts that come our way come from no other source than evil itself. And we need to be aware of that. And with that in mind, can I encourage you, it's really important what you allow to influence your thoughts. It matters what you bring into your homes. It matters what your eyes and ears, which are the doorway to your mind, what you open up and allow to come in the movies you watch, the music you listen to, the games you play, those are all things by which satanic powers are able to influence our thought. You, like, you know that, right? And can I just say this? Like, from a parental standpoint, like, parents, keep your guard up. I'm not saying you need to go live in a cave, right? And, I, and I'm not saying you need to be ridiculous. We'll talk about this here in just a moment. What I'm saying is there are some things 
that are labeled as fun or scary that are actually demonic. And we need to be careful what we allow into our minds, into our homes, into the minds and the lives of our kids because some thoughts come from evil sources. Here's another one, though. Some thoughts come from the world, right? We're, we're quick to just blame the devil for everything. And some thoughts, they just, they just come from the world that we live in, the culture that is around us. John gives us a, a filter for this. First John chapter 2, verse 16. He says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So we live in this world, so there will be times where our thoughts are affected by it. And so we, we run it through that filter. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Those things, when we think about those things, it helps to serve as a filter for our thoughts, and we need to consider what is good. Look, there, there are things out there that are entertaining in a positive way, right? Again, you don't have to go live in a cave somewhere, but you knew, do need to be wise. I grew up learning that there are times where you need to eat the meat and spit out the bones. You ever heard that? Right. We have to do that with the world around us. And then, like, brace yourself for a minute. Because some of you, I'm, a, I'm about to burst your bubble. <laughs> here's, here's one last source. Some thoughts come from our foolish mind. There are some thoughts that you might want to blame the devil for, and there are some thoughts that you might want to blame the world for, and they're just all your fault. <laughs> like sometimes that's just the way that it is. The, the Bible in the, in the book of Proverbs contrast quite a bit the difference between the wise and the foolish. And sometimes there are thoughts in our minds that are just foolish. James chapter 1, verse 13 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Well, watch, this is verse 14. Watch this and remember this. We'll come back to it later. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Did you, did you notice he didn't blame the devil there? He didn't blame the world there. He says, it's my fault. I have these thoughts in me. So the question is, how, how do you know which thought is which? How do you know the source and where they come from? We'll, we'll point out more of this as we go through this series. Sometimes it's experience and time. Sometimes it's the leading of the Holy Spirit. We're gonna specifically call out some different thoughts as we go through this process. But the first question you gotta ask yourself when, when, you're, when you're wrestling with these voices in your head, where is this coming from? What is the source of this thought? Which leads us to the second one, number two. The second question you should ask, is this true? Not just where did this thought come from, but is this thought true? Does it have a certain sense of fact or reality? Is, is this thought that I'm thinking true? Let's go back to that passage in Genesis chapter 3, and let's ask that question as we read through this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say for the record, that's a slick move right there, isn't it? Did you know what he did there? He, he caused her to doubt. Like he asked her this question in such a way to put a crack in the trust between her and God. Like did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And if you've read Genesis chapters one and two, you know that's not what God said. Verse two, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it. That Eve added that just for dramatic effect. <laughs> but it's not what God said. Or you will die. <laughs> You'll not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What the serpent does there, it takes the seed of truth and turns it into a falsehood. It's a half-truth. Ultimately, it's a lie. There's a whole lot there that's going on, which causes us to ask the question, is what I am thinking true? Like, like does, this, does this matter? How does this play out? Is what I am thinking true? We'll ask that question over and over again as we go through some other parts of this series. Here's a good filter for you. If you want to know what you should think about, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Paul writes, finally, brothers and sisters, 
whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Like, like what he's saying is there, when you have these thoughts come through your mind, here's, here's a filter, here's some things you can ask yourself, and if you're saying to these things no, then probably these may be some things that maybe you shouldn't be thinking about. It's important for us to get that because we have to learn to stand guard on our minds and recognize what's real and what's not, what's right and what's not, what's true and what's not. Because at some point, learning to recognize those things helps us to guard our minds and our hearts. Have you, have you, ever, have you ever heard the phrase, seeing is believing, right? That's not always true, right? You, you can't believe everything that you see. Just because you see it doesn't mean that it's right. There was a school district in Florida that just had their school crossings repainted you know, on, the, on the road right where the kids are crossing. Here's a picture of how one of them came out. Not quite right, right? It's not a school crossing. It's a skull hole crossing right there. It was funny because the school district like, put out this statement where they said, like, look, we did not do this. This was an outside contractor. We're getting it fixed right away. And at the end of the statement, they said, thank you to all who brought this very important matter to our attention, which is code for, we're tired of hearing you talk about it. Stop it, right? <laughs> well, we know who's not winning the spelling bee, true? <laughs> but you see that, and what do you immediately go? You immediately go, that's not right. That's wrong. I know enough to know that when I look at that, I don't go, oh, maybe that's how you spell school now. <laughs> you look at it and you go, that's not right, it's wrong. You can't believe everything you see, and can I challenge you, don't believe everything you think. Like everything you think is not right. Just because you think it, it doesn't mean it's true. Our thoughts lie to us all the time. And just because you think it, it doesn't mean that it's true. So in the same way, when I saw that school crossing, I said, that's not right. I need to recognize that there are thoughts that go through my mind and times when I go, that's not true. That's not right. When I learn to think that way, it helps me to avoid destructive thought patterns, to respond effectively in avoiding temptation. It helps me steer clear of repeated mistakes. How many of you would like to steer clear of repeated mistakes? How many of you would still like to steer clear of repeated mistakes, right? It helps us to identify the places where our thinking is wrong or misdirected. And here's, here's why. One of the things I've come to find out in my own life and in interacting with other people when they're in a struggle is that our struggles often come from wrong thinking about ourselves and wrong thinking about God. Like oftentimes our struggles come because we have wrong thinking either about ourselves and or wrong thinking about God. Now, that's really important, and we're, we're going we're gonna to dig into this wrong thinking about ourselves quite a bit, but let's, let's just take a moment and talk about some wrong thoughts about God, because did you notice that the very first words out of the serpent's mouth, the very first time in Scripture where we see the idea where someone's thoughts are challenged and there's voices in their head, the very first thing that the serpent says is, now, did God really say like he immediately starts by challenging who God is. Let me give you some wrong thoughts about God. We'll, we'll put some of these up here as wrong thoughts that people sometimes have. One of those is that God cannot be trusted. I mean, the serpent initiates that right away. Did God, did God really say this? And he challenges the word of God. He creates this crack right away in the trust and the faith that, that Eve had put in her creator. This is why knowing what the Bible says is so critically important. For some of you that, that may be new to your faith, maybe even just last week you made a commitment of your life to Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you how important it is that you know what the Word of God teaches. We, we just started last Wednesday, and you can still jump in. Class at 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights called Exploring Faith. For those of you that are new to your faith and you want to learn more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, if, if this is all new to you, we have a resource we'd love to give you. It's, it's called a New Believer's Handbook. And if you've just started to believe in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, it's got some tools in there that can help you to understand what that's all about. Knowing what God's word says is important. We're gonna take time to do that because if you don't know those things, then you start to wonder if God can be trusted. Another thing that the serpent did, here, here's another wrong thought about God, is that God's word can be interpreted to our standards. That we can take what God's word says and make it fit what we want it to say. 
Eve does that in this passage. The serpent does that in this passage. They take God's word and they twist it just enough to be able to make it say what they want it to say. Another wrong thought that we have sometimes about God is that God is keeping something from us. Like somehow, and and, and the serpent gives this idea that there's good things that are out there for me. It's just God doesn't really want me to have them. He doesn't want me to have that good time or or things in scripture are old fashioned or, or it's dated thinking or we say, look, I can handle this on my own. The reality is God isn't trying to keep anything from you. He's trying to get his best to you. And yet so many times we we wrestle with that in our thinking, which leads us kind of the most destructive of them all, that we can be like God. That's what the serpent says to Eve. You'll you'll be like God. And you might say, I don't don't think that. I didn't wake up this morning, sit up in bed and go, I think I'll be a God today. Like, you don't think that way. But every time we sin, every time we choose to do what we want to do, Every time we hurt another person by trying to exercise control over them, when we destroy truth with our lies, when we respond in anger instead of trusting God with the situation, when we dismiss what Scripture says about finding joy and peace and rest in God and instead try to do it on our own, we set ourselves up as little gods and try to have control in our lives, and we push the real God out of the way. The critical question to ask about your thinking What's the source of this? Where did this come from? Is this true? Can I trust it? The first day of this month, April 1st, is a day we often refer to as April Fool's Day, right? And what we try to do is we try to pull a little joke on somebody, right? We try to get them to believe something that isn't true. We try to lead them down some path that's not right. And some people love it and others hate it, right? There's a lady in the last service that when I mentioned it, she just went, yeah, like (laughs) preaching about resentment, a little heavy in that service sometime, right? (laughs) She's holding it. The reality is what happens is somebody tells you something that's not true, and then they try to get you to believe that. They try to lead you down that thought process, and what happens is you immediately start calculating, right? Your mind goes to, well, if that's true, what does that mean, and how do I have to respond, and what are the consequences, only to find out April Fool's, right? Which sometimes is funny. Most of the time is irritating. And the truth is, how many of your thoughts are playing that same trick on you? Not just on April 1st, but every day. And you're giving way to thoughts in your lives that just aren't true. Those are the voices in your head, which leads us to the third question that we need to ask. We we ask ourselves, where is this from? We ask ourselves the question, is it true? Here's the third thing, number three. Who is in control? When that thought's in your mind, It's good for you to ask the question, who's in control here? Let me me show you why. Genesis chapter three, verse six. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. (laughs) Settle down. Okay, now watch this. There's something interesting that happens. If you've read chapters one and two, then you know that at creation, God did something really unique for humanity. Genesis chapter one, verse 28. It says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Listen to this. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God said to humanity, God said to Adam and Eve, everything you see here, you're in charge. And nature, you have dominion over it. And those creatures, you rule over them. You are in control. But do you see what happens here, ironically? The snake that Eve is supposed to be in control of now has control of her. And those thoughts, those voices in her head are now directing her actions. Here's the question you need to ask yourself. Are you controlling your thoughts or are your thoughts controlling you? And some of you go, oh, that's that's good. Don't just say that's good. Think about it. Like the last time you did something that you regret. Maybe on the way here. (laughs) Are you controlling your thoughts or are your thoughts controlling you? Look, Paul writes to us about this, about how our thoughts influence our action. 
2 Corinthians chapter 10. And when he does, he doesn't use metaphors or language like from the world of parenting where you're raising up a child. He does that in other places. And he doesn't use language like of, like of gardening. He does that in other places. When he talks about this, he uses strong, deliberate military language. Listen to what he says. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Watch this. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Is that sissy language? (laughs) No, that's harsh military language. He's saying here, take your thoughts captive. The first Wednesday of each month, we we do what we call First Wednesday, catchy, huh? And and on that Wednesday night, we take some extended time, if you've not been before, we take some time to worship, do a short teaching, and then we spend some time in prayer together. This Wednesday night is our first Wednesday for May, and we're going to dig into this concept, because it's one thing to say, take your thoughts captive. It's another thing to say, how do you do that? Like, I know sometimes I've got those thoughts, I know I should take them captive, but I'm not as effective as it as I'd like to be. Anybody else? I feel inferior. Anybody else? Right, there's those moments. And this is harsh language here. And we have to learn to identify those thoughts. And then in those moments when those thoughts come, we have to learn how to take away its strength, right? We have to substitute it with another thought. We have to put that thought in its place and we have to make sure that it does not escape again. Like that's a part of the process of taking that thing captive. And so we'll talk about this as we go through this series because sometimes you just, you, you can't just sit back. You got to act on these things. We, we have two cats and one of, one of these cats, for whatever reason, just loves me. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know why. I mean, I understand and everything, but this cat, <laughs> this cat just loves me. And so there's these times when she, she's just so relentless, she won't leave me alone. So I've got this little it's kind of office in our basement, and I'll, I'll work down there a lot on my messages and stuff. And it happened again just yesterday. There's these times where this cat just comes, and just wherever I am, she doesn't want to just be with me. She wants to be on top of me, and especially on my keyboard. Does that make sense? <laughs> right? This is what this cat does. And sometimes like, I'll throw a little toy, or I'll try to move her off to the side or do whatever. But there are times where I've just got to go, I can't do this right now, and I have to pick this cat up, and I have to step outside of my office, and I have to throw, I have to place her down, okay? And then quickly, I gotta close the door because I gotta shut that thing out because as long as she's there, I'm not productive in what I have to do. Nothing happens until I take that cat captive and put it in its place. Have you ever had to do that with your thoughts? Here's here's where the challenge comes for a lot of us. For a lot of us, it is very easy to get lazy in our thinking. It's very easy to get lazy in our thinking. And if you wonder, is that me? Then the answer is yes, (laughs) right? Part of my hope through this message is that there would be something through this series that would cause you to see the places or hear the voices in your head in a whole new way that somehow brings a different kind of life to you. There was a story recently from a 59-year-old guy who was suffering chest pains and he had an erratic heartbeat and he called 911 and they came and put him in the ambulance, Nebraska, and they were on their way taking him to the hospital and on the way, as they're trying to deal with him, figure out what happens, the ambulance hits this big pothole and it jolts the whole thing, bounces the guy up and down, and when it does, his heart goes back into normal rhythm. (laughs) Praise God for potholes, right? (laughs) There's hope for us this spring. (laughs) My hope is that this series for some of you will be like a pothole that jolts your heart back to the right place. That That you can hear God's voice clearly again over the other voices in your head. Because for some of you, the thoughts of fear or lust or doubt or resentment or low self-worth and inadequacy or anger and hate, these thoughts have become not just the common thing in your mind, they've become the normal thing in your mind. And you might need a pothole 
to push your heart back into the right rhythm and hear some of this. Or for some of you, maybe you've become so down in this or you've become so entrenched in some of these voices that it's time for you to step up and step out and not just leave those voices in your head, but do something about it. Listen to what the psalmist says, Psalm 42, verse five. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God for I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. Did you see what the psalmist said there? He identifies that something is not right in his thinking. Why, why are you so troubled? Why are you so downcast? And here's what he decides to do. It may be time to stop listening to yourself and to start talking to yourself. Now look, I know we've said that before, but the reason we're saying it again is because I need to hear it again. Anybody else? Like there's times when you need to stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. We're all friends here, right? Well, most of us. Um, yeah, we are. Let me just be honest. Like I know it happens to you because it happens to me. You know, you know when those voices kind of stirred up in my head Monday morning after one of the best weekends that I've ever experienced in ministry in my life over Easter weekend. And guess what started in my head on Monday morning? Those voices. Do you want to know what those voices were saying? It's none of your business. Because <laughs> I got my voices and you got yours. But you know what I had to do? I had to stop listening to them and I had to start talking to them. And I had to start identifying where they were coming from and pointing out the things that weren't true and letting them know that they weren't gonna have control over me in my day because I knew truths from God's word that were different from what they were saying to me. Does that make sense? And look, for some of you, you need to do this because if you don't, it puts you in such a dangerous place in what God has called you to do. Do you know what's interesting about that passage? Who really takes it on the chin in that story? It's not the serpent, it's Eve, isn't it? And yet, you know what I think is a tragedy? It's how long you hear about her until you finally hear about him. And then when you get there, do you know what it says? Oh yeah, Adam, because he was with her <laughs> that whole time and didn't speak up, and didn't do his part. He dropped the ball, because he was listening to the voices in his head too. One of the tragedies of these voices is that when you listen to them, oftentimes it will put you in a place where you fail to do what you were called and created to do. Who's controlling you? You or your thoughts? It's a really important question to ask if you're gonna think about your thinking. One last one, number four, last one. Ask this question, where's this going? Like this, this thought that's in my head, if I, if I let it play itself out, where's this thought taking me? I'm not saying you, you shouldn't daydream, and I'm, I'm not saying critical thinking skills aren't important. I'm just saying if, if you let your thoughts wander down that path, where does it end up? For Adam and Eve, it wasn't so good. Genesis chapter three, verse seven. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together. That's pathetic. So they sewed th fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Next week, we'll, we'll, we'll launch into the rest of this story. Talk about where it goes and, and what it means for us there. But what's interesting is because they didn't think about their thinking they took steps that changed everything, not just for them, but for humanity. You gotta ask yourself the question, where will this thought lead me? Like, what's on the other end of this thing? If I was gonna talk about it in very general terms, the, the question you might ask is, will this thought lead to peace? Like, like is this gonna lead to peace in my life, in my, in my home, in my family, in my relationship with God, in my relationships with others? Is this thought gonna lead to peace? Isaiah chapter 26, verse three says, God, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. If you wanna have peace in your life, did you see where it starts? It starts in the, anybody? <laughs> anybody? It starts in your mind. 
Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. What's envy? It's a bad thought that goes too far. But a heart at peace gives life to the body. Ask yourself the question, if I, if I, if I let this thought, if I keep wandering this thought down that path, is it gonna lead to peace or will this thought lead to unrest? Is it, is it gonna lead to peace? Here's the second question, will this thought lead to unrest? Do you remember when we talked about how James said that, that some of our thoughts come from ourselves? Remember, this is what he said, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after death, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. If I follow this thought, what's on the other end of it? Peace or shame and failure and uncertainty and fear? Adam and Eve failed to ask these questions of the voices in their head and ended up in a place that they just did not want to be. We're tough on them, but it's not so different for us. I hope these questions help to serve as like a, like a sentry or a, or a guard that when you have some of these thoughts, there's a voice in your head that asks the question, where's this coming from? Is this true? Who's in control here and where's this gonna take me? In Peru, or excuse me, in Brazil recently, there were a couple of drug dealers that had a parrot that they would keep in the window and whenever the, they had trained this parrot that whenever they saw the police, the parrot would go, mama, police, mama, police. That's what the parrot would say. The parrot is now in police custody. It's good for you to know. <laughs> Open its mouth too many times. But here's what I thought. That's, that's kind of ingenious. It's bad, but it's ingenious. What is there in my life or maybe in my thinking that when something's coming my way that I need to be cautious of, warns me? What, what's the sentry? What, what tells me that the voices in my head are gonna take me a place where I do not want to be? Here's, here's the trick about this series of messages. Like my hope is that it's helpful, right? And as we specifically start to deal with some of the topics that we're gonna look at, that there will be tools that you have, scriptural tools, they're gonna help you as we process some of these things. Here's the challenge, though, that for many of us, we're gonna go, man, I wish I had changed my thinking sooner, or I wish that things were different, or I wish that I'd caught that, or I wish I'd known how to deal with those voices in my head. Maybe things would have been different. You ever think Adam and Eve might have thought that? They lost a lot, but here's what they didn't lose. Genesis chapter three, verse 21, tells us that the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. This is after God has spelled it out, and he said to the serpent, and he said to Adam, and he said to Eve, hey, here's the consequences of what you did. And then it says that God went and he made garments for them because the fig leaves were pathetic and terribly uncomfortable. And he said, look, I'm gonna do something for you. And so God was willing, track with me here for a minute, God was willing to pay the price. Do you think he just unzipped those skins from those animals? What had to happen to those animals? They had to die. God was willing to pay the price so that even in the midst of their sin and shame, he could cover them with grace. I don't know what the voices in your head have told you but I can tell you this, that God brings grace to the voices in our heads. He comes alongside of us and he wants you to know that no matter where you're at, he is right there with you and can cover you with his grace. Not just for these voices, but it's interesting what else he had said because when he talked to Eve about the consequences of what had happened there in the garden, he also says this to the serpent. He says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And he says to the serpent, yeah, you're gonna cause humanity problems, but at some point there is going to be a son of this woman who is going to crush your head. You know that's what we celebrated last weekend. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price for your sins. 
And when he rose from the dead, he conquered that bad boy once and for all. There is hope and there is grace and God brings forgiveness to our shame. As we walk through this, don't you for a moment let the enemy who likes to get in your head tell you that you're defeated because God came to bring grace to you and clothe you with his forgiveness. So I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. Whether you're here in Auditorium 1 or you're over in Auditorium 2 or you're, you're watching on a screen somewhere, take just a moment and think about this. Two groups of people that I, I wanna encourage today. One is there's, there's some of you you would say, God, I look to you today, and this is something that I needed to hear today. I needed to hear this message of grace. And Father, I'm looking to you, and I'm asking you to help me with the voices in my head and to cover me with your grace today. If that's you, would you just, would you just raise your hand real quick? You can raise it and put it right back down. Just say, God, I needed to hear this today. I need your grace in my thoughts. I need your help with the voices in my head. Just between you and God. Lord, thanks, I needed this today. I also would ask, maybe there's, there's some of you that the, the question isn't so much I needed this today, but God, what I need is you. Maybe you've come to realize I can't do this on my own anymore. And what I need, God, is your forgiveness and I need your direction in my life. We often talk about the fact that, that Jesus died for our sins and he can bring forgiveness because he's our savior. Jesus rose from the dead and he lives and he can bring life and purpose and meaning because he's our Lord. And possibly you're here today and you'd say, Chad, I need to begin or begin again a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I can't do it on my own anymore and I need him as my savior and as my Lord. If that's you, whether you're in this room or you're watching on a screen, if that's you, would you just raise your hand and say, today I need to begin or begin again that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Anybody else? Say, today, I need to begin or begin again that relationship with God. Here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. If you raised your hand either one of those two times, or if you know that Jesus is your Savior and your Lord, would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus, for sending your Son to die for my sin. I ask today that you would forgive my sin and be my savior. You are the risen Lord, and I give my life to you. When those voices in my head start speaking loudly, may I look to you, my savior and Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, look, if you prayed that for the first time today, as you step out of the auditoriums, I hope you'll grab one of these cards it says, I have decided, and then stop by our Connection Center. We have a Bible that we'd like to give to you and some resources that, that will help you on your decision to follow Jesus, and we'd love to pray with you about that as well. Also, don't forget, this Wednesday night, first Wednesday, we're going to talk and, and put into practice how do you help to take all those thoughts captive. Let me pray for you before we go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for your word today. Thanks for how you, you speak to us and how you direct us. Lord, I pray that as we go from here, you would help us to keep these thoughts in mind so that our minds would be a place where you can bring life and peace and hope. Now, as we go from here, we ask that you'd go with us. Send us out with your special favor and with your wonderful peace. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you Wednesday night.